Good evening, Mount Calvary and friends. Again, welcome to uh, Wednesday in the Word. We're so delighted that you are joining us tonight. And as always, we do not take your presence for granted, for we do know and understand that you could be watching any ministry throughout this nation, throughout this world, at this particular time, but you are watching us, and for that, we are indeed grateful to you. My brothers and sisters, we uh, study the Word of God because we find hope in the Word of God. We're able to grow spiritually from the Word of God, and the Word of God helps to keep us balanced in our everyday lives. So that's one of the, of the three main reasons why we study uh, the Word of God. Allow me to also say thank you so much for uh, your contribution to the Texas Relief Fund. Uh, you, uh, you did exactly what Mount Calvary uh, is supposed to do, and we expected no less from you. So thank you so much for your contribution. Uh, this Sunday is uh, HBCU uh, Sunday, and again, we're asking for a donation uh, in order to keep a student in uh, HBCU. So any contribution that you can give would be most appreciative. Many of you uh, can testify that uh, you would not have gotten an education if it had not been for HBCU uh, that took you in. Uh, so it's time to uh, give back, to give back to HBCU. So make your uh, donations on today. Uh, the rest of this week, of course, on Sunday uh, when we celebrate HBCU Day. Shall we bow? Shall we pray? Oh, God, our Father, how grateful we are to you for allowing us to gather in this virtual setting once again. We thank you, God, for your grace and your mercy, your joy and your peace. We thank you for this chance to confess and repent of our sins. And we thank you for your forgiveness. We pray tonight for those who are in need of a word or in need of a touch from you. We know, God, that you're well able to do what no other power can do. So, Master, we join our faith with their faith. We intercede on their behalf. We pray that you will heal those who are sick, comfort those who are bereaved, strengthen those who are weak, encourage those who are discouraged, calm the fears of those who are afraid, and refresh those who are tired. God, we know that you are able to meet every need, whatever that need is. So God, we ask now that you do it in the name of Jesus. Now God, be with us in our study this evening. Open our hearts and our minds that we may be receptive of your word, your will, and your way. For it is in the name of Jesus the Christ we pray, and the redeemed of the Lord said, Amen. Uh, we will continue on with our uh, series dealing with grace, and uh, tonight we're um, going to talk about a grace that liberates, a grace that liberates, and we're looking at uh, Galatians 3 and 3. Uh, the series title, of course, is Good News About Grace, Good News About Grace, and uh, the goal of this series is for you to not only understand grace, but for you to experience grace, for you to feel grace, and for you to enjoy the grace of God in your life. And as we uh, have be uh, begun to discover that there are many aspects, uh, many expressions of grace. If you remember, uh, several weeks ago, we started this series all talking about a grace that saves. Uh, the foundation of our salvation is we are saved or we were saved by grace. The second week we talked about a grace that sustains, a grace that sustains. Uh, last week we talked about a grace that heals, a grace that heals. So tonight I want to talk about a grace that liberates. And of course uh, the discourse will be framed around Galatians uh, 3 and 3. And in the New Century version of the Bible, Galatians 3 and 3 says, You began your life in Christ by the Spirit. Now you're trying to make it complete by your own power. That is foolish. A perfectionist is one who tries 
to prove their worth by being perfect. It is my opinion that trying to be perfect is the number one hangup of dedicated Christian believers. It happens like this. When you first become a Christian, you take all of your sins and you give them to God. You accept Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior. And in turn, he gives you heaven, forgiveness, and power for living day by day. And it's all free. However, as time goes by, you start thinking, this has got to be too good to be true. I got to help God out a little bit. Surely he expects something from me. Uh, surely he expects to gain my approval. As a result of this kind of thinking, you fall into one or two traps. And both, both of these traps are enemies of grace. One is legalism, trying to earn God's approval through rules. The other is perfection, trying to prove your worth by being perfect. The book of Galatians was written to combat these two enemies of grace. Again, Galatians 3 and 3 says, You began your life in Christ by the Spirit. Now you're trying to make it complete by your own power. This is foolish. In other words, you cannot earn God's approval by trying to be perfect. You cannot earn God's approval by trying to be perfect. And some of you have been living in the prison of perfection. Perhaps it's been a self-imposed prison, but you've been there for a mighty long time. You have been robbed of your joy and your freedom, but tonight you can get clemency. You can get your pardon. You can get set free. The jail door is going to be unlocked. And it's going to be unlocked by the word of God and you can walk out as a free person. You do not have to live under or in the prison of perfection anymore because God is a liberating God. However, the only way that you will be able to walk out of the prison door is to have faith and not fear. To have faith in God and not fear. Trust God and walk out. So tonight, let's look at a grace that liberates to ascertain how to break out of the perfection trap. How to get out of uh, the prison of being a perfectionist. Uh, how to get out of the performance trap. Because trying to be a perfect, perfectionist is in the faith very destructive and detrimental to your life. So let's look at first three things that being a perfectionist uh, does to your life. One, it defeats your initiative. It defeats your initiative. In your mind, you're waiting for uh, the perfect circumstance. You're waiting for the perfect timing, for the perfect environment. You're waiting until the kids get out of school. You're waiting until you get a certain amount of money. You're waiting. As a result of trying to be perfect, it has caused procrastination. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 11 and 4, if you wait for perfect conditions, you'll never get anything done. So being a perfectionist defeats your initiative because you're always waiting on the perfect time. And the perfect time never happens. Two, it damages your relationships. It damages your relationships. 
you do not enjoy being around a person who is always correcting you. In fact, nobody likes being nagged all the time, corrected all the time, straightened out all the time. It's frustrating and it's irritating. The Bible says in Proverbs 7, 9, love forgives mistakes. Nagging about them parts the best of friends. So does nagging work? It doesn't work at all. Nagging only makes you defensive. It makes the person you are nagging defensive. The desire to, to, to always correct damages relationships. And three, it destroys your happiness. Ecclesiastes 7 and 16 says, Do not be excessively righteous. And do not be overly wise. Why should you ruin yourself? That verse doesn't even sound like that it should be in the Bible at all. Do not be excessively righteous. And do not be overly wise. Why should you ruin yourself? What the writer is, is really saying is, don't take things to the extreme. He's not talking about genuine, genuine righteousness. He's not talking about real wisdom. But he's talking about being a perfectionist. Do you not know that you can take any virtue and make a vice out of it by taking it to the extreme and ignoring the balancing parts. The writer says, why ruin your life? Why ruin yourself? The good word translation says it like this. Why make yourself miserable? In your mind, you have this picture of your ideal self. This is what you put on your job application, your ideal self. This, this is what shows up on your first date, your ideal self. But that ideal self is not the real you. There is always a gap between the ideal and the real, between who you want to be and who you would like to be, who you think you ought to be and who you are. There is a major gap between the ideal and the real. So the ideal is always nagging the real in your mind. There's this going, ongoing conversation in your mind all the time. Shape up. Surely you can do better than that. Get with it. Why did you do that again? Aren't you ever going to change? There is always this little scolding going on in your mind when you are in the perfectionist mode. You're always saying to yourself, I'm too skinny, I'm too fat, I'm too tall, I'm too short, I'm too uncoordinated, I'm, I'm always late, I'm never going to change, I'm not good at this, and the list goes on and on. Being a perfectionist will cause you to constantly criticize yourself, put yourself down, demean yourself, degrade yourself, it will make you unhappy. Now that you know what being a perfectionist does to you, what is the cure? Well, there is only one antidote to being a perfectionist. And that is to relax and experience the liberating grace of God. So how do you learn to relax and experience the liberating grace of God? I'm glad you asked. You asked to write somebody. Allow me to give you five quick ways. One, realize that nobody is perfect. Nobody is perfect. And although that's a no-brainer, you have to start somewhere. 
Psalm 119 and 96 says, nothing is perfect except God's word. You need to build your life on God's word because nothing else is perfect. What society tells you is not perfect. What popular opinion tells you is not perfect. What you learned growing up is not perfect. The only thing perfect is the word of God. And if you spend all of your time trying to attain perfection, trying to make projects perfect, you're wasting your time. You don't have the time and you don't have the money to be perfect in everything. And even if you do, you can't. Ecclesiastes 7 and 20 says, There is no one on earth who does what is right all the time and never make a mistake. You are per imperfect. And there are a lot of things in your life that are not okay. But when you accept God's grace, he says, that's okay. You don't have to be perfect. So what does that mean? Does that mean that God isn't interested in your growth? Of course God wants you to grow. Does that mean that you don't have to repent? Of course you have to repent. Does that mean that God doesn't want you to change? Of course God wants you to change. But God says you're okay because of his grace. However, that does not mean that you can just keep on doing wrong for the rest of your life. It means that God isn't waiting for you to become perfect before he loves you. God is waiting to accept you by his grace just as you are. So you have to realize that nobody is perfect. Number two is enjoy. You need to enjoy God's unconditional love. 1 John 3 and 1 says, see how very much our Heavenly Father loves uh, us, for he allows us to be called his children. Think of it. And we really are his children. John calls us children. When you become a believer, when you become a follower of Christ, you are not only a servant of God, but you are also a child of God. A lot of people think, uh, when I give my life to Christ uh, and, 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 and for the rest of my life, I'm going to serve him. Sure you are. But you are much, much more than just a servant of God. You are now a child of God. You are now a child of the king. You are in God's family. And because you're in God's family, you are now a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Now, there, uh, there's a difference between a servant and a child in this context. A servant is accepted and appreciated on the basis of what he or she does. A child is accepted and appreciated on the basis of who he or she is. A servant starts the day anxious and worried if his or her work will please the master. A child rests in the security of his or her family. A servant accepts, a servant is accepted because of his or her workmanship. But a child is accepted because of his or her relationship. A servant is accepted because of his or her productivity or his or her performance. But a child is accepted because of his or her position in the family. At the end of the day, a servant has peace of mind only if he or she has proven his or her worth by his or her work. A child can be secure all day knowing that tomorrow will not change his or her status. When a servant fails, his or her whole position is at stake. 
In fact, he or she might lose his or her job. But when a child fails, he or she is grieved because he or she has hurt his or her parents and he or she will be corrected and disciplined, but he or she is not afraid of being thrown out of the family and his or her confidence in belonging and being loved is based not on his or her performance, but on the stability of his or her position as a child of God. God says he wants you to enjoy his love unconditionally as being part of his family. And those of you who are parents, you can understand that because uh, you know that your child, children, they, they are not perfect. In spite of their imperfection, you still love them. Even when they were two or three years of age, of age and uh, perhaps they brought you a picture, and the picture was uh, not all that it was supposed to be. But uh, you always said to that child, baby, that's perfect. And so what are you really saying? That's perfect for that stage of your maturity. It's not saying that you are Michael. Angelo or Rembrandt or Van Gogh or Da Vinci, but it's perfect for where you are. You want to love your children at every stage of their growth and not just wait until they are mature and say, now nah, I love you. Some of you think God is waiting for you to grow up before he's ever going to smile upon you, before he's ever going to give you a thumbs up sign. No. God loves you at every stage of your growth because his love is unconditional. You do not have to be perfect for God to love you. He understands, com uh, he understands you completely. He knows everything about you, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and he still loves you. Romans 8.31 says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Notice that God is not just with us, but it says God is for us. That is the essence of the doctrine of grace. God, uh, grace can be summed up in four words. God is with us. God is on your side. God is not sitting up there in heaven looking down on you saying, what can I punish you with next in life? But if you receive God's grace and you become a part of God's family, then God is for you. Three, let God handle things. Let God handle things. At the root of a perfectionist is the desire to control, which gives rise to one of the symptoms of a perfectionist, being constantly fatigued. Because you are always trying to control everything. You are constantly fatigue. But believe it or not, it is tiring trying to be the general manager of the universe, holding all the strings together, keeping all of the balls up in the air at the same time. Contrary to your belief as a perfectionist, you do not have to try to make things perfect in order to prove your worth. But you think, as a perfectionist, if you can just control things, then things will be perfect. If you can control your spouse, then you will have the perfect marriage. If you can control your kids, they will never get in trouble and always be safe. If you can control the people around you, the world will be a better place. Things don't have to be perfect for you to be happy. 
Things don't have to be perfect for you to enjoy them. Don't you know that there's no such thing as a perfect vacation? If you are wanting one or waiting for one, you're never going to enjoy one if you're just waiting for the right time. There's no such thing as the perfect marriage. You married a sinner. So there's no perfect marriage because people are imperfect. Who thinks you can put two imperfect people together and have a perfect relationship? There's no perfect marriage. There's no perfect kids. There's no such thing as a perfect body. There is no perfect church, no perfect job. The Bible says there's nothing perfect but the Word of God. If you're trying to uh, wait for the perfect environment to enjoy life, it's not going to happen. So what do you do when you try to control the uncontrollable things in life? What do you do when you try, but you can't control the uncontrollable things of life? 1 Peter 5 and 7 say, cast all your anxieties, cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. The essence of casting is letting go. To overcome being a perfectionist, you have to let go. You have to let go and let God do God's thing. Let God handle the things of your life. So how do you let go? How do you cast all your cares upon the Lord? Pray. Until you learn how to pray effectively, then you are not going to let things go. Paul says, like, says it like this. Uh, Paul, 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 Paul said, I've learned to be content in whatever situation I am in. I've learned to be content no matter what state I'm in. Notice that Paul says, I've learned. You are not by nature content, but by nature you are discontent. It is not human nature to be content. It's something you have to learn. You must learn to enjoy life in the middle of imperfections on less than perfect circumstances. You have to learn to enjoy life. You have to learn how to love the moment in the midst. Everything does not have to be perfect for you to enjoy the moment. In spite of having bills to pay, uh, learn how to enjoy the moment. Let go. Let God. For act in faith, not fear. Act in faith and not fear. Remember how you got into the family of God in the first place. In Ephesians uh, 2 and 8, it says, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. That is the only way that you're ever going to get saved is by grace. If you don't get saved by grace, you are not saved. There is no other way to get to heaven except by the grace of God. You will never be good enough. You will never be perfect enough. You will never earn enough. You can't buy your way there. If you're not going in by grace, you are not going in at all. Because this grace is a free gift for God. And it is by grace through faith. The way you got into the Christian life is a way that you continue the Christian life. The way that you became saved is a way that you continue to be saved. The way that you became a believer is a way that you will continue to be a believer. By grace through faith. Faith, by grace through faith. Uh, Colossians 2 and 6 says, so then, so then just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him. You are not saved by grace and then live by works. 
Yeah. You are not saved by grace and then live by works. A lot of people think that. You have been saved by God's free gift, but you don't have to work hard as a Christian to keep God's approval in your life. So how were you saved? By promising to be perfect? No. How do you live the Christian life? By promising to be perfect? No. How do you live the Christian life? By keeping the, the Ten Commandments and by promising to obey all the rules? No. It is by grace through faith. You need to understand that everything in your life is a gift from God. You would not even be alive today if it weren't for the grace of God. The air that you breathe is a gift of grace. The mind that you have is a gift of grace. The ability to see and to hear, they are gifts of God's grace. Everything that God does in your life, he does for one reason. And that one reason is grace. God teaches you by grace. He forgives you by grace. He guides you by grace. He uses you by grace. God gives you gifts and talents by grace. God blesses your life by grace. God gives you family, friend, friends, and freedom by grace. Five and finally, it's changed your perfection for God's peace. It's changed your perfection for God's peace. Being a perfectionist destroys God's peace in you. Beloved, you are going to live with one or the other. Perfection or peace. This is the offer Jesus Christ makes and is still valid today. It is an offer that you really can't afford to refuse. Matthew 11, Jesus says, are you tired, worn out, burnt out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you will re re recover your life. And I will show you how to take a real rest. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. What a deal. What a deal. God is perfect. And because God is perfect, God expects his children to be perfect. Jesus even said it. He said, be ye perfect, even as I am perfect. But he knows there's no chance that you're going to be perfect. He knows that is an impossibility. And that's why he came up with grace. That is why God sent Jesus, because Jesus was perfect. And we get in on Jesus' perfection. You can either try all you want, or you can just accept the perfection of Christ and says, let me in on his ticket. As you read the Bible, uh, you discover that God's perfect standard of perfection. You read many things and you know that there is no way that you can measure up to God's perfection. There's, there's no way that you can keep all of those principles and follow all those rules. There's no way that you can be the kind of person God says a perfect person is. But you don't have to worry because he has already taken care of that for you. By grace, he has been made perfect for you. In other words, when God looks at 
a redeemed child of his. He sees us through the blood of Jesus Christ. And so, therefore, he's able to see perfection in us because he's not looking at us in the flesh, but he's looking at us in our spiritual selves because we have been regenerated, born again, saved by the blood of Jesus. I invite you to receive Christ's offer. The Christian, Christian living is based on grace and not guilt. And beloved, you're going to have a lot of failures in life. You're going to fail at many responsibilities that you have been given. You're going to fail to live up to the expectations that other people have placed on you. You're going to let them down. You're going to fail your own expectations. And of course, you're not going to measure up to God's standards of perfection. The Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory. But you don't have to worry about that if you receive, if you receive God's, God's grace. In fact, there's only one failure, one failure that you ever need to worry about. And that one failure is found in Hebrews 12 and 15. Be careful that no one fails to receive God's grace. Be careful that no one fails to receive God's grace. So I invite you, even now, to receive God's grace. It's, ch it's changed your perfection for God's peace and experience the liberating power of God's grace. If that is you tonight, all you need to do is just type in the comment section, I surrender, to become a part of God's family, to become a child of God, and live your life, live your life, with God's grace abounding every day. You can be set free through the liberating power of God's grace. You can be delivered through the liberating power of God's grace. Not tomorrow, not the next day, but you can do it tonight. If you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He died for your sins. Got up on the third day morning. He's alive and well, sitting in heaven, making intercession for believers. Confess your sins. Confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life. And the Bible says you shall be saved. And you begin to experience the many facets of God's amazing grace. Shall we bow? Shall we pray? Oh God, that we thank you for your liberating grace. We realize we are not perfect, but we thank you, God, for your unconditional love towards us. God, help us to believe that you are for us and not against us. Help us to uh, let you handle the things in our lives. Help us to relax and cast all our cares and our anxieties upon you. Oh God, your grace can save us. And your grace can also help us live the life that you meant for us to live. Help us, God, to learn the unforced rhythm of your grace. God, we thank you now for the power of your Holy Spirit. We thank you, God, for that person who accepted you as their Lord and Savior. We thank you, God, for the time that we've had to share with you and each other. Now bless us, God. In the name of Jesus, we pray.
Amen. God bless you. Thank you again for joining us tonight. Please continue to stay connected with us uh, through Facebook and YouTube. Uh, we invite you to uh, our Sunday morning worship experience uh, at 11 a.m. on Facebook and YouTube. And, of course, we look to see you back here on uh, next Wednesday for Wednesday in the Word. May God continue to bless and keep you. May you have a wonderful week. And be blessed, be encouraged, stay in his grip. God bless you.